Well, Dr. Grandin, let's start at the very beginning. From your perspective, what is autism? Autism is a neurological disorder the child's born with, and it can vary from uh, very severe, where the child remains nonverbal with many other problems, maybe epilepsy and seizures, to geniuses out in Silicon Valley. You know, you get a little bit of the autistic trait, you might get a Mozart or an Einstein, you get more of the trait, you can get very severe problems. One of the main problems in autism is, uh, you know, lack of uh, social understanding. There tends to be repetitive, fixated interests. Often these kids often get intense special interests, and we need to use those special interests to motivate schoolwork. Kid likes airplanes, let's teach reading with airplanes, math with airplanes. So are there actual differences in an autistic brain? Yes, there tends to be. A, uh, a, an abnormal early overgrowth in the brain, especially in the back part of the brain, the frontal cortex, the brain's executive function kind of gets left out. And in some cases, maybe we have some extra mathematics circuits back here, and that might explain some of the savant skills. I want to emphasize not everybody on the spectrum is a savant. Autism is a very, very broad spectrum. Some are visual thinkers like me, think in photorealistic pictures, kind of like Google for images. Others are pattern thinker, kind of think chess, origami, organic chemistry formulas, sort of more abstract patterns, good at math, may have trouble with reading. And then some of these kids may have a terrible time with algebra. I was one of those kids. There's a bunch of kids that cannot do algebra. They can do geometry and trig, and they need to go to geometry and trig. And then there's another kind of mind. It's a word thinker, and they're not a visual thinker. See, one of the things about the autistic mind, it tends to be good at one thing and bad at something else. And we've got to work on building up the strengths. Let's talk a little bit about your own situation. When did you learn or when did you realize that you were seeing things differently than some of us? Well, when I was a little kid in high school, I thought everybody thought in pictures. I didn't realize my thinking was different. And I didn't fully understand the extent of how my thinking was different until I wrote my book, Thinking in Pictures. And that would have been in the mid-90s, and I updated that in 2006. And I asked people, think about a church steeple. And I was shocked to find out that some people get this vague stick finger figure image. I just see specific ones. I can tell you exactly where they're at. There is no generalized one. But a lot of people got generalized pictures of things in their mind. And that was a real shock to me to discover that. But I didn't discover it until I started talking to other people about how they think. How have those traits, how have they helped you in your professional life? Well, being a visual thinker, it really helps me as a designer, and I want to emphasize there's a lot of people that do not have autism that are also visual thinkers. My visual thinking is more on the extreme end, because when I draw a drawing, I can actually test run the piece of equipment in my mind. Most other visual thinkers, designers, you know, they can make the still picture but not test run it. And uh, that's going to be a great asset for a designer to be a visual thinker. Yeah. And it sounds like you believe that we could be integrating autistic children much more into the classroom, into everyday life. Are we, could we lose a generation if we don't do this? We've got to start thinking about when a kid's in middle school, what's he going to do when he grows up? They need to learn, you know, work skills, being on time, doing an assigned task. You know, I'm very concerned that schools have taken out so many of the hands-on classes. If I hadn't had art class and sewing class when I was in elementary school, I would have just been dead. Those are the classes that made school meaningful. And my science teacher in high school had all kinds of great hands-on projects, and that got me turned on. Now I had a reason to study becoming a scientist. It seems as if we're seeing more cases of autism. Is it just that we're more aware of it, or are we seeing an increase in the disorder? You get the very mild type of autism, you know, the sort of Sheldon, Big Bang Theory type, geeky types. Those have always been around. They have always been here. I can think of kids I went to school with that would be labeled Asperger's or mild autism today, where I think there may be some increase in some very severe autism, especially where the kid seems to develop some language, and then all of a sudden, they lose it. Mm -hmm. And understandably, many families that have a ch child with severe autism, they're looking for answers, and they've looked at various things from immunizations to vaccines. What are your feelings there? Well, parents are always, some parents are always looking for like a magic bullet or something like that. And I want to emphasize, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of early educational intervention with these two-year-olds working hours and hours of one-to-ones. If you're somewhere where you can't get the service for your two- and three-year-old, get go to your church, get some grannies, get some students, get in there and work with that kid because nothing's the worst thing you can do. Okay, the vaccine thing's showing, a lot of studies are showing there's no effect. 
But I think there's still one study they need to do, and that's to look at this regressive group. This is where the kids have some language, and then they lose it. We need to study that subgroup separately to totally close the book on the issue. Mm -hmm. in, in, in treating the disorder, where do we go from here? Well, the main treatments for autism are the right kind of education. We've got to start out with these little kids getting at least 20, 25 hours a week of interaction with an effective teacher. And that effective teacher can be somebody's grandmother. But you can't just let them sit in the corner, you know, vegetating and rocking. You know, I used to do all this autistic behavior because sound hurt my ears, so I'd rock to block out the world. Well, if I block out the world, I'm not going to develop. Some kids absolutely cannot stand fluorescent lights because it's like being in a discotheque. These sensory problems really are real. Now, the other thing is you've got to teach autistic kids all the social rules. Autistic kids have to learn by being taught. You've got to learn how to take turns. They don't instinctively kind of know the social rules. They've got to be taught table manners. Everything has to be taught like being in a play. And this is where my 50s upbringing helped me. Also, you've got to get them out and expose them to new things. A lot of times these kids don't want to do new things. And I didn't want to go to my aunt's ranch when I was 15. Mother says, you know, you're going to go. Ended up loving it, and I ended up staying there all summer. You've got to get them out doing things. I was taught things like being on time when I was a little kid. Well, you know, I was like, I don't know, seven years old or so. I got an alarm clock, and I was expected to learn, use it and get up on time. And when we return, we will talk about Temple Grandin's other passion in life, animal behavior. <laughs>